Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minor. Dealing with a terminal illness is an almost unbearable cross to bear, both for the family and for the patient. In this segment of Real to Real, we're going to meet a lady who devotes much of her time to the counseling of the terminally ill patients. We'll also examine a practice that is gaining in popularity today, not only because of the enjoyment it provides, but also because of its practicality, urban farming. Our short segments feature a very special message from Monsignor Minaw and a look at the creation of clay vessels that lend simplicity and beauty to the celebration of the liturgy. Just this year alone, some 800,000 men, women, and children across the country were diagnosed as having cancer. As you can well imagine, this diagnosis places a tremendous emotional burden both on the person and on their families. And sometimes they seek the help of a practice therapist who skillfully, almost lovingly, guides them through their emotional response to this diagnosis. We found such a person. She is Janet Kay, cancer patient counselor at the Medical College of Pennsylvania. Despite medical breakthroughs that have prolonged our life expectancy in cases where it was impossible before, it is a fact that doctors cannot cure all of their patients. But today in medicine, doctors are trained to save lives. The doctor is omnipotent, and if they don't save lives, then maybe they aren't doing their job. I found that this is where Dr. K's work begins. Well, along I come and I say, it's all right. You always don't have to save. Our job is to care for others and to be there and comfort others. And when we don't save them, there's another way of behaving. It is from the concerned doctor sitting around this table that Dr. K learns of the patients in the hospital who could be cheered up by a visit from her. For Ed Coleman, the diagnosis of Hodgkin's disease came a few months after recovering from open heart surgery. For him, it meant he could no longer be in control behind the wheel of his tractor trailer. He stays home most of the time while his wife, Rosemary, goes to work, except for his routine treatments at the hospital and now his visits with Dr. K. What are some of the fears of a, of a man with Hodgkin's? Perhaps you could share that with us, Ed. Not being able to get out and do my job mm -hmm. is uh, really a downer. As mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. uh, I would sooner be out working 10-15 mm -hmm. hours a day than sitting home and doing nothing. Do you go out at all during the day? I remember you telling me you like to garden a little. Yeah, I like to putter around out uh -huh. there, but uh, even that uh, is a string. <laughs> Uh, we have a great big house, a great yeah. big house. Oh, is that yeah. right? And uh -huh. uh, Ed has now been limited to some of the things that he can do, which now leaves a lot of this heavy, burdensome work on me. Uh -huh. And uh, that's a lot of the strain. I didn't realize how much of the odds and ends he was doing that I'm now picking up. Mm -hmm. According to Dr. K, cancer patients experience many of the same fears during the course of their illnesses, such as the fear of annihilation, the fear of loneliness and of complete isolation, the fear of death by pain or by suffocation. For Ed, it is the fear of falling or causing further injury to himself and even possibly, as a result, to suffer a setback in his illness that keeps him away from the things he enjoys and could still do. The couple that... Uh I worked with earlier this morning, Ed and Rose Marie. Now, one of the things he mentioned during our session together that he feels a little less of a man 
because he's weaker now and his wife is taking over many of the roles he had in the family, such as mowing the lawn, taking out the garbage, this type of the thing. And he feels less a man. Mm -hmm. Now, many people, when there is illness in a family, there is role change where the woman has to start taking over some of the roles and children have to start mowing the lawn. And you have to let a family know when there's illness, this is okay, this is natural, and that you're as a family unit, you have to learn to redistribute the roles. Now, this is a way that we can help by talking about it, by getting it out in the open, that you're still a man, and you don't have to be a man to mow the lawn. You can just be a man from sitting there and talking to me mm -hmm. and making me feel good. When they know I'm there to listen, it's mm -hmm. almost as if you're taking away a dam, everything opens up. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I have had no one to talk to. My husband's too afraid to talk to me, and my relatives all pretend I'm going to get well and walk out the door. I mean, for them, it's a release. While working on this story with Dr. K, I was told about a priest in the Camden, New Jersey area, Father Mike Mannion, who had the opportunity to spend some time with a very special young lady who had leukemia and was dying. You might remember reading about Robin Noble, whose last several months of her life were the subject of a series of articles in a local newspaper published just about a year ago. Robin had one very important question for Father Mike. If she died before her 18th birthday, would she be kept out of the adult section of heaven where her parents and older sisters would eventually go? My thoughts to Robin were, God loves you as you. And if you go to heaven as an adult, and you need to be an adult in heaven, God loves you as you. Robin's first concern was not about her death. It was, I want to get closer to my family so we can share about really important things before I die. That was Robin's first concern. And she systematically had it planned almost when she was going to die. She went to the hospital four or five days before and said goodbye to the doctors and nurses that she had known for seven or eight years. Stop the chemotherapy, the treatment, and then died four days later. Dr. Kay, could you describe or explain some of the immediate or acute needs that your patients have? The patient finds out he or she has cancer, Many people seek to avoid them. Mm -hmm. Cancer, the big C, oh, you're going to be dead. Um, it's catching. I better not eat in the same room with you. In fact, I don't think I'm going to visit you anymore. The employer is a little concerned. Oh, you have cancer. You aren't going to be giving me a good work day. You can get fired very quickly. I mean, there are so many misconceptions with the disease. Once you take personhood away from a dying person, there's not a lot left to cope with. Even your faith support system seems to be weak. Oh, we'll do everything for you. We'll take care of this. We'll do that. And of course, okay. yes. with all the good intentions, you mm -hmm. might be demasculating the person, depersonalizing the individual with all good intentions of compensating for his or her physical weakness or psychological depression. Or Often, it's the crazy little things that hit first. Do I have to quit jogging? Can I go to the baseball game next week? Some may deny the doctor's diagnosis and seek a second opinion. Others remain hopeful that they'll be cured. And still others will disregard their own physical pain and worry only about leaving behind the people who do depend on them. Often, it's not so much that they're afraid of dying. It's that they have so many things they haven't done yet and still want to do. For Robin, it was reaching her 18th birthday. For Ed, it's fishing. You asked me about a special lady before. Well, she's very special. She came to me, and she had never wore slacks. She's in her 60s. And she said, oh, maybe I shouldn't wear a slack. I said, go on, try it. <laughs> so she wore slacks. That was number one. She had never been on an airplane, and she wanted to visit her brother in Florida. And we talked. We spent sessions about what it meant traveling and going to an airport, carrying a suitcase. And once she overcame all this, she went to Florida. And now she's traveling all over the country. But I'm trying to say that she is living a fuller and richer life now that she has her disease than ever before where she used to leave, well, what she said, a pretty boring life just sitting at home all the time. Each 
receiving a diagnosis of cancer does not mean death. If anything, it can mean a better life for you because you can stop and evaluate what you want from mm -hmm. your life. So mm -hmm. with someone like this couple, Rosemary and Ed, uh, they can get through and really look at each other, their relationship with each other, and things can really improve for them and move forward. Well, home at last. But you can be certain that Dr. K's thoughts will linger over the people she saw today. People like Ed and Rosemary. But she doesn't seem to mind. Some people may call Dr. K an angel of the dying. I think she would prefer to be called an angel of the living. And Ed and Rosemary, thank you for being part of our story. Our prayers are with you. The golden red colors of fall are certainly beautiful to behold, but there's a bittersweet idea about them. For as lovely as they are, they seem to indicate to us separation. We're now separate from the lightly, lovely tones of springtime, and we know now the fullness of summer is all gone. And as soon as these leaves fall and this ground becomes hard, winter will have set in. We know life is still there, but we're separate from it. And when the chill of winter comes, we have to discover a new dimension to living in separation. But while it's cold, we must remember, life in separation is always a chilling experience. It is not only the seasonal changes which bring about to us the idea of life in separation. There are the day-to-day -day routine things that happen to us. There's, for instance, that we have to leave each other and go away and be apart one from the other. That's separation. There's a separation that takes place in every relationship when there is anger between the partners. And of course, Physical illness always causes a separation in a relationship. But in all those and other examples of life and separation, it's important that we continue to develop the dimension of a new love within it. So that if I am angry with you or you with someone else, it's important that we be the first ones to do what we can to reconciliation or to say I am sorry or apologize. And sick people will do the best they can to suppress their pain so as not to disturb those who are well. 
And when we are apart one from the other, we live a new dimension of loving because we cannot wait for the moment when we see each other once again. Of all the situations of life and separation, the most difficult, obviously, is the one that death causes. For when death separates us one from the other, we have a whole new experience. But I wonder if it should be so new. Perhaps it's such a difficult experience for us because we do not experience it sufficiently in our day-to-day -day separations. So that if we work harder at the diligent love we have for each other in those separations which take place day by day, we then will be more prepared to receive and to work at the experience of separation by death. But we are Christians, and we believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. The Lord promised it personally, and we know that when we are united one again with the other in our resurrection with the Lord, we shall never have to say goodbye again. Mention a visit to a farm, and immediately you conjure up an idea of rolling green hills, dotted with cattle, and alternating rows of various crops. But in recent years, farming has taken on a new meaning. In New York City, for instance, urban farming has become as familiar as, say, the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty. New York City, a city where people have come to accept heavy traffic, smog, trash, and dilapidated buildings as part of everyday life. It seems so far from nature. Most people have no idea that this area was once valuable farmland. Now to a thirsty person in a desert, a long-awaited oasis may seem to be a mirage. So too would gardens seem to be in the middle of a city. But no, it's not a mirage here in the South Bronx. A lot of hard work turned this into this.
Gary Waldron is the man who first conceived of the idea of city farming. He had worked for IBM for 16 years and was also on the board of directors for Glee, a nonprofit community action group. One year, he took a leave of absence from IBM to develop an urban farming project for Glee. While many people returned to their original jobs after their year away, Gary decided to put all his energies into making the urban farming project pay off. During that year, uh, a number of ideas occurred. Uh, I began to become very involved in working with the young people and thinking about some of the ways to develop economic development in the South Bronx. And this is obviously one of the ways. It's not the only answer. But it's a way to produce, uh, produce jobs, uh, to produce uh, very fresh produce and plants right in the South Bronx, and to market it to the largest market in the world, to New York City. The order of business for today yes. is uh, you're going you're to initially, that's right, you're initially going to go to Cortona. If we get the lumber delivery this morning, uh, you're going to have to bring, bring some folks back to here to help. It's about 350 pieces of very heavy lumber. I'd suggest you check with Kevin, uh, ask him whether or not he's using those here for the soil that's here. The other half of the team is Kevin Swank. Kevin is a, uh, is a, a, a schooled horticulturist, uh, a graduate of Cornell University, uh, one of the finest people I've ever met and a very talented horticulturist, uh, and has taken everything that you see on this lot and all of the other lots from seed. And he's taken a, a, a complement of workers with relatively low skills and has trained them in the course of two months to begin to take care of this very, very large array and diverse array of, of plant material that we have here. At some point, without lifting the plant out of the ground, out of the box, we want to remove all the damaged leaves, and they will continue to develop from the center, just like lettuce does. The other thing to check is that these were planted in Jiffy 7s, and that netting around them should be removed. These we're going to plant here on this site once we have some more of the beds finished. There's a lot of learning going on here. Seems there's good growing soil for plants and people. A lot of these are ready to be potted up right away. The roots have you know, clearly come through these jiffy strips, and they're ready for new pots. These city farms began to spring up just last April. Initial aid came from CETA, HEW, and New York State Youth Employment, as well as a few private grants. Then Glee leased land from the city for a few hundred dollars a month. Up went the greenhouses, and up went the enthusiasm of the 40 workers who were being paid to work at something they enjoyed. Even with future funding in question, these city farmers should be okay. Their five sites are already almost self-supporting. We're growing um, an assortment of things, some of which are currently not being grown much in this country. A lot of, which are, a lot of the plants that we're growing are being imported at the moment. This is a gourmet garden. A great variety of fine herbs is grown, along with exotic vegetables like Cornish cucumbers. That's because rare vegetables are far more profitable for the urban farmer to grow than the everyday vegetables. We're not in a position to be in, in, and can't run competition with large nurseries or, or large-scale farms, Jersey, Long Island, Westchester. You know, we're, we're urban farmers. We're, this is, this is, we don't have much space. We're limited. So now, the seeds for this radicchio came all the way from Paris. It's one of the items that's imported at the moment. Not very many people are growing this in this country, and it's kind of hard to come by. So one of the ways we make this operation work is to select and identify crops that, for those reasons, are somehow more valuable than snap beans that somebody in Jersey could grow 50 acres up. The whole purpose of the project is to sustain employment, to keep people in jobs. And the only way we can do it is to use our space effectively, use our know-how very effectively. We've got to stand on our own two feet here. And that's just what these folks are doing. There are 10 workers on each crew. Jim Fleming, a former psychologist, is one of the crew chiefs. My um, thing has to be motivation. I have to show them, not only just tell them what to do, but make them understand why they have to do it. Because a lot of times when you just tell somebody, you know, hey, go ahead and do this kind of work and whatever, they won't understand and they won't have as much enthusiasm to it. But they feel they're learning at the same time, then it's a lot different. It's funny because a lot of my friends, 
And I told them that I'm doing this, that they really, you know, laugh. I said, I don't know what the world can you be doing farming in the Bronx, come on. But when I show them the pictures, it's like, wow, you know, you're really actually doing those things. One of the nice parts yeah. about the whole greening process is that it has a, a certain aesthetic associated with it. Uh, you obviously are taking uh, abandoned and vacant and rubble-strewn lots and changing them into something that's more attractive and, in this particular case, more functional. That, that it's a functional use of space, it's an aesthetically attractive use of space, and it's a job producer. Over here, what you see is a wall that uh, was built by the workers here. This is the first time they've ever attempted to do it. it just took cement and rocks and bricks and rubble, whatever they can put together, and they built the whole wall up. Work goes on at the five different sites all day long. It's hard, it's hot, and it's heavy, but it's worth it. One of the things that's really satisfying is that horticulture is such a satisfying occupation. I mean, the, the people that I have working with me in the greenhouse, they're here an hour early for work. That's unheard of on a lot of projects, coming an hour, hour early, not being ready to go home when it's time to go home, feeling really good, seeing change, and also seeing that, that there's fruits to their labor. I mean, every day they come in, there's something new happening. Something's in flower, something's fruiting, something's ready to be transplanted, things are growing. I'm hoping to develop, uh, an agribusiness is not the right word, it's, it's really a, a, a small business that is labor intensive, that produces 40 or 50 or 60 jobs, that combines uh, plant materials and certain varieties of vegetables and, and greenhouse growing and mushroom production all together into something that makes some cohesive business sense and at the same time continues to provide jobs to local people. Presumably I'm bringing some business skills and Kevin is bringing a lot of horticultural skills to this process. Whatever skills an individual has, part of the object in life is to give it back. And uh, I feel that there's a certain mission here in the South Bronx amid all this decay and uh, what was once devastation. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm challenged and excited to be part of the Renaissance. We have asked you so many times to write us, and many of you do, and you say such nice things, and we're pleased. One I'd like to share with you. It came the other day from Mary Ellen Traveling from Wood Heights, New Jersey. Real to Real came on TV the other night, right after I had been watching 60 Minutes. The contrast between the two was amazing. The beauty of Real to Real brought tears to my eyes and hope to my heart. Maybe that seems trite, but it's the truth. All I can say is thanks, and we thank you very much. Next week, we'll begin a two-part examination of the disturbing and rising presence of cults in our society and see how they can change the personality of those who become cult members. We'll also look at the permanent diaconate program in a distant diocese of Fairbanks, Alaska. Our short segments feature Father Bruce Ritter on Runaway Kids. As always, it's so good to be with you. Thanks for joining us, and God bless you. <laughs>